Okay, today we're going to talk about the danger of convenience, but uh, before we get started, I want to read an article here, just real quickly, just another thing against 501c3 churches. Uh, it's an article called, Turn in Your Guns at Your Local Church. I'm just going to read the first paragraph here. It says, Last weekend, the Chicago Police Department collaborated with over 20 local churches in a giant effort to encourage Chicagoans to, quote, get guns out of their homes. WBBM News Radio has the story. Quote, Using the lure of $100 gift cards, the Chicago, Chicago Police Department is encouraging people to get guns out of their homes and turn them in this Saturday during the annual gun turn-in program. The thing that's interesting about this, it goes on in the article to talk about it, but in Chicago, you're not allowed to legally carry a gun on the streets. So it's like, okay, if you have a gun in your home, you have to break the law to get the gun to the police to turn it in. It's kind of like, yeah, okay. But why are churches being used as the centers for gun confiscation? Or gun turnings, excuse me. It's not forced yet. I just want to read the list of churches here that are that participated in this. In the northern part of Chicago, you have United Church of Rogers Park, Sounds real spiritual. Uptown Baptist Church. In the West, you have Heritage International Christian Church, Truth and Deliverance International Ministries, Mount Vernon Baptist Church, Corinthians Temple, Kajik. Okay, Chicago Islamic Center. Muslims and Baptists working together to help get guns off the streets. Keep reading here. Douglas Park Baptist Church. St. Agnes of Bohemia Catholic Church. Muslims, Catholics, Baptists, and non-denominational Christians all working together. Greater Harvest... Oh, this is in the South now. Greater Harvest MB Church. I'm not sure what MB would be. Uh, First Church of Deliverance. New Beginnings Church. Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. St. Sabina Church. Sounds like another Catholic church. Trinity All Nations Church. Bethlehem Star MB Church. New Visions of Faith Ministries. Immaculate Conception Parish. It's kind of obvious what that one is. Another Catholic. New Life Covenant Church. Greater Salem Baptist Church. Liberation Christian Center. Antioch Missionary Baptist Church. Yeah, I love that one. Greater Institutional AME Church. So those are your churches that participated in with the police to take away people's Second Amendment rights. Very interesting. As time goes by, you're going to see more and more true Christians having to depart from having to depart from these government incorporated churches. But anyhow, let's get into the message now. Uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary uh, definition of the word convenient is uh, quote fit, suitable, proper. Adapted to use or to once, commodious, followed by two or four, usually by four. And uh, then it goes on to quote um, Proverbs chapter 30, Feed me with food convenient for me. Um, so we'll, we're actually going to be covering that verse as we continue. But basically I see two different definitions within this definition there in Webster's 1828. First you have the positive use of convenient, which is fit, suitable, and proper. The negative would be adapted to use or wants. There are some things, and that's what I want to talk about today, where you have things that are convenient that are adapted to your wants, but they can actually be a problem. So let's look at positive convenience. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start out there. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And here you have Paul's instruction for a Christian. It says here, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, that it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient but rather giving of thanks. Now, when you start getting into filthiness and foolish talking and jesting, they are not fit, suitable, or proper for a Christian. 
It doesn't mean that you can never tell a joke. It doesn't mean that you can never laugh or never be funny or anything like that. That's not what the verse is saying. It's saying, look at the first one there. You have filthiness. If you hear tell, if you hear a, a dirty joke, don't repeat it. You know, well, I probably shouldn't tell you this joke, but if you have to start out that way, then you have no business finishing it. Okay. How about foolish talking? Well, what's the Bible say? The fool has said in his heart there is no God. Foolish talking would be talking in a way that is not giving God glory or in a way that is, you know, saying something that you wouldn't want God to hear. Okay? And there's a lot of people that do that. They talk and they act like God is somehow not around, not hearing them. I remember I had a, a uh, relative the one time say, um, about he was watching some topless thing, woman or something on TV, and it was a funny video, you know, it was some kind of candid camera thing. And, and, uh, one, I think it was my father was there, and he said, Would you have watched it if, if the Lord was in the room? And he was like, Well, no, I, w I wouldn't have done that. And he said, Then why did you? God was in the room. God's not, you know, oh, he's, he's away at the moment. Oh, quick, let me tell you this dirty joke doesn't work that way. Filthiness and foolish talking go hand in hand. What about the third one there? Jesting. What's a jester? A court jester back in the Middle Ages or, or whatever. They acted like a fool. They dressed like a fool. They acted like a fool. So again, you have just being totally goofy and, and stupid and, and just, you know. The fact of the matter is, you are a saint. If you are saved, you are to act holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's a command as a Christian. So we have to be careful how far we go with the thing of joking. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to have fun. But just be careful that you don't go too far with it. Why? Well, because it's not convenient. All right? Not fit, suitable, or proper. Okay? It would be kind of like if you saw the Queen of England walking by, and all of a sudden she just started you know, pulled out a couple different colored balls and started juggling them and, and laughing and acting weird. It'd be like, what? You know, the queen? It'd be, it would be very, very strange. You would expect her to, to, to carry herself in a very royal, royal, very regal kind of a way. And, you know, as Christians, we're called to live higher than the world, the lost world around us. Turn to Romans chapter 1. We'll go there next. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And of course, the word convenience, by the way, I was going to say this earlier, the word convenience is not in the Bible, but convenient is. That's why we're going to hit a couple of these verses. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. It says here, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. But what are those things that are not convenient? Well, it lists them here. Verse 29, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural, under, or without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now notice that the things, all of the things listed there, there is actually some that will not send somebody to hell. Okay? What about uh, without understanding? See? That's not going to send you to hell per se. Okay? What about uh, unmerciful or how about whisperers? See, the, the list of things here are not convenient. Okay? And, you know, what's the point? Well, they are not fit, suitable, or proper for a Christian. Alright? Now, if, you, if you're saved and you start to whisper, you know, and it doesn't mean you're whispering to your kids at night telling them good night or something. It doesn't mean that. It means whispering in the sense of gossiping is how that would be, you know, best in interpreted. You say, how do you know that? What's the next word? Excuse me, what's the next word? Backbiters. See? A backstabber is what we would call it today. You know, 
well, some people could still say backbiter, but the point is there are some things within this list that are just not convenient. They're not going to help you. They're not fit. They're not suitable. They're not proper for you as a Christian. Now we're going to look at some negative um, verses dealing with things that are convenient. Okay, things that are, that's the one definition, things that are not proper or suitable or fit. All right. The other definition would be things that are in society that are made for your convenience, but you can actually get ensnared by them and you can actually have problems. Proverbs chapter 14. Go back to your Old Testament to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Okay, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. It says here, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Did you know that there are many things in this life that are convenient for you to do? And yet, if you keep doing them and keep living with them, it will actually kill you quicker. And we're going to be talking about some of that here as we continue in the study. And unfortunately, you will often find that the easy things in life are the things that will kill you the quickest. Usually the things that are the best for you are the hardest to do. The you know When it comes to food, and I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the things that taste the most bland or, or whatever, those are the ones that are good for you. The really, really sweet, really, really salty, really whatever, those are the ones that are bad. And speaking of food, turn over to Proverbs chapter 30. This is an interesting passage here. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7. Okay. It says here, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Okay, two things that uh, he's asking for here. Uh, verse 8, Remove me far from vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Okay, very interesting there. What, what were the two things that he required of the Lord? Well, you see the first one there separated by a colon and then the, the second one has a semicolon in the middle. In other words, there aren't three things, it's just two. The first one would be remove me far uh, remove far from me vanity and lies. That's the first one. The second one is give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me. You say what does poverty and riches have to do uh, give me neither poverty um, nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me. Well, it explains it in the next one, in the next verse there. Lest I be full and deny thee. If you have more money than you know what to do with, well, you don't really need the Lord because you say, well, I got, you know, two million dollars in the bank. I'm never going to go hungry. I never really need to worry about food, putting food on the table. So you're full and you deny the Lord as a result. You know, and say, who is the Lord? See there? And the other uh, part of that is poverty there, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. You know, if you're very, very poor and there's no money at all and you have no ability to provide food, you'll be driven to steal. You know, and the point is there that you don't want to be, you know, remove me or remove far from me vanity and lies which you definitely don't want. You want to live a humble, satisfied life of pursuing the truth. That'll be a good life to live. And the second part, oh, well, actually, let me quote a verse here. Third uh, John verse one or chapter 1, verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And then the other one, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So, you don't want to be either poor, and you don't want to be rich. 
Why? Well, because a poor man will be in bad health because he can't buy food. A rich man, and this is kind of where I'm going to go with this, this passage here, a rich man will oftentimes be poor in poor health because he buys the wrong kind of convenience food. And you say, well, but the Bible says that we can eat anything as long as we give God thanks. Right? No, it doesn't. First Timothy chapter 4. I used to always kind of believe that. Well, if I had to, to eat candy bars to survive, I guess, you know, I just have to do it, you know, and that's not what the Bible teaches. You have to be very careful. Every word of God is uh, so very precious, and you can't just go through the Bible and, and uh, oh, that's what this means, and, and, you know, I heard this commentator or this great preacher say such and such, so I'm going to go with his interpretation. You always have to be open to what the Scripture actually says. And that applies to anybody here at Bible Believers Fellowship, too. Don't just take my word for something. Search the Scriptures for yourself. But the First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, give a very interesting prophecy of the last days, the latter times. It says here in verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, what are these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? What do they tell people? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Did you ever hear of forced vegetarianism? I didn't say voluntary vegetarianism. Somebody says... I just want to eat vegetables and fruits for a little bit, you know, organic type of stuff. That's fine. I'm not condemning that. But when you have it forced upon you, you know, it says commanding to abstain from meats. All right? And it, and the new versions there, again, these wicked new versions, they'll say certain types of food. They change the word meats. They cover up their sin. You see, because... The new versions come from the Vatican, and the Vatican on certain days of the week tells you you're not allowed to eat meat. It's a commandment. You know, Fridays or whatever it is, you know, the fish, or, yeah, they eat fish. Which, you know, Dagon's one of their gods, the fish god. I'm not going to go off on that right now, but the point is, they do command. And then, by the way, uh, what else do they do? Are you a celibate priest? A celibate nun? What about a monk? Well, that would be forbidding to marry. So you want to find a, a church that is filled with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know, when you have no conscience that you can molest a child and just go, oh well, and then go out and do your priestly duties and stuff. That's having your conscience seared with a hot iron. So you want to know what Satan's church is, according to these scriptures right here. It's the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church with the Pope as the head. And a lot of churches, you know, oh, I, I don't want to name the names or something like that. That's so cowardly. I get sick of that. But anyhow, look at verse 4. You saw up there in verse 3, it says, commanding to abstain from meats. What kind of food are we talking about here? Verse 4, for every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Did you know that there were Old Testament laws saying that you shouldn't eat certain types of meat? Did you know that those Old Testament laws still have some good instruction in righteousness? There are some animals that are not good for you. Okay, there's a lot of them. I mean, pork is good tasting a lot of times. And it's sometimes it's very convenient, you know, to, to throw some bacon in and whatever and fry it up and you know, hot dogs and whatever else. <laughs> but, uh, you know, mystery meat, you know, spam and, and such things like that. But the point is, uh, there's a lot of things that, that can go wrong with pork. And you really have to cook it well and all that other stuff. It's it's There are animals out there that you really got to be careful about eating. Okay? But if you look at the verse there, it says, Every creature, every creature... It does not say for every kind of food is of God is good. And by the way, it says creature of God. What's that mean? It's the creatures that God creates. Okay? Not some kind of, uh, you know, 
man-made thing or something like that. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what's out in nature. You know, I heard a story here this past week. I was listening to a guy talk about the Great Depression, and he said about how his dad would tell him stories of that, what it was like to go through it, and he said one of the things that they would eat was sparrow soup. And you say, well, oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, but when you don't have anything else to eat, you'll you'll like it. I read a thing one time, a guy said about how that his grandmother used to eat possum. You know? And we kind of go, ugh, possum? You know, they eat dead animals. Yeah, but when you don't have anything to eat, you'd be surprised what looks good. So, you say, what's the point here? What's, what's the danger of convenience? Well, what about convenience food? Like fast foods, TV dinners, things like that? You say, well, it's quick. You know, I can just get it. I can go through the drive through and all that stuff. And, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I, hey, I'm not some kind of self-righteous guy that's never done that. Okay, there are times I have done it. Okay, there are times I'll still do it. But the point is, there's a danger there. You can't live on that stuff. Okay? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I heard a story about a woman that was eating chicken nuggets every single day for like 15 years. That's all she ate. Chicken nuggets and soda. And she got, she had to go to the hospital. Like her whole body was shutting down and the doctor told her, you can not eat chicken nuggets again or you will die. And she was like, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, what was going on there? Well, there was convenience food. It was quick. It was easy. She didn't have to cook anything, but it was killing her. Okay, there was a way which seemed right to her, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, little simple thing that you can remember is, and this is very often true, unless you're eating raw food, fast food equals fast death. Something that you can remember. <laughs> okay, don't live on that stuff. How about convenient study? You say, I, I just, uh, I don't know, I don't have much time here to study this stuff. Acts chapter 24. I'm going to show you kind of an interesting thing. Acts chapter 24, verse 24. And I deal with this an awful lot with people. But uh, this thing of convenient study. Something that's adapted to use or once. You adapt it to your time frame and whatever else. Acts chapter 24, verse 24. And after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled, got scared, and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. He hoped also that money should have been given him of Paul, that he might loose him. Wherefore he sent for him the oftener, and communed with him. But after two years, Porcius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. Was this guy really interested in hearing the truth? No. What was his desire for being in contact with Paul? He hoped to receive money of him. He hoped maybe Paul had a rich friend or something like that that, you know, maybe he posted bail or something and, like, nobody showed up <laughs> to bail Paul out, you know. I mean, Paul talked about when he was in bonds that, that everybody forsook him and fled, you know. It's just kind of funny. But, uh, because yeah, it would be very true today of a, of a lot of Christians. But the whole point is, he said, when he heard the truth, he trembled. And he said... Go thy way for for a season, you know, when I have a convenient, or excuse me, go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. How many times have we experienced that here at Bible Believers Fellowship? Oh, that's very, very interesting. I, that's an interesting subject. Uh, but, uh, hey, i got to get going, you know. I'll, uh, when things slow down a little bit, I want to hear more about this and, you know, yeah, I'll, you know, hey, here's here's a book. Would you like to read that? Yeah, I'll I'll try to read it, you know, sometime. Uh-huh. You see him a year later, hey, did you read that book? 
Oh yeah, um, I I've just been really busy. I I don't remember. Uh, no, actually, mm-hmm. It's not convenient. And you know, I get kind of irritated with some people. You know, and 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 please, if you're hearing this, don't you know be afraid to write to me or anything. That's not what I'm saying. But some of the brethren will write to me and they'll ask me questions, and I'm going. The answers are right on the websites that we link to, at our church website. It's like, you know, how do you answer people on this subject or on that subject? Look it up for yourself. If you do all the study and put in all the time and all the research and you still can't find the answer, then yeah, contact us. But it's just like people want to come to a pastor or to somebody that, that knows a lot of issues and just like, you answer all my questions for me so I don't have to do the work. You know, you have to put in some time if you're going to study. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. Verse fourteen is where we're going to go. Okay, it says here, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Okay, kind of like the the people that refer to quote unquote the Greek. You know, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Isn't that interesting what we read earlier? Fil filthiness, foolish talk, jesting. You're not supposed to name that, or not supposed to do that because it's not convenient. Very interesting here. Uh, there are certain things, there are certain people, especially if you're online, I mean, if, if you're listening to this stuff on the internet and you get onto YouTube and you get onto, you know, anything out there, kind of a public thing where people can put up sermons, there are some people that are profane and vain in their babblings, in their preaching. And you say, well, I just wanted to hear another angle to it. I, you know, I wanted to study. You're supposed to shun that stuff. You see some guy and he's claiming to be a Jew or something like this and he's a Messianic Jew and he's saying that the rapture is a satanic heresy and that Jesus is a Greek pagan deity or something. Just like, okay, whatever. Don't even watch that stuff. And that's another thing that frustrates me. I get Christians, you know, well, how do you answer this guy? How do you answer that guy? I watch these videos and my faith is really shaken now. It's like, shun that stuff. Don't waste your time on it. Okay, when you are studying the Word of God, spend your time, go to somebody, if they use the King James Bible, okay, that's one good point for them. Usually, that's a very good point, especially if they defend the King James Bible. If they are anti-Catholic, you know, against, speak out against the Catholic Church, another very good point. And then you can get down through the list. If they are pre-trib rapture, that's also very good. If they know about the New World Order, that's good. If they're not 501c3, also very good. The more of those points that they're right on, the more safe it will be to listen to that person. Okay? But when you start, you know, I had a brother write to me this past week, I guess, and he said he went to some ministry or something and was listening to him, and they started saying that the Catholic Church is very similar to, similar to us. We just have a few differences. And he was like, okay, done. That's the right thing to do. What was he doing? He was shunning profane and vain babblings. Somebody comes out and says the Catholic Church is okay, just shut them off. Don't keep listening to them. Don't waste your time on them. Uh, but look at uh, verse 17. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Did Paul name names? You better believe it. Verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Like I just said, all these people, oh, I just I used to believe in the pre-trib rapture, and I used to believe the King James Bible, but I don't anymore because my faith has really been shaken. <laughs> well, what happened? Overthrow the faith of some. See? they. I just want to go to one website and find out all the truth. Uh, that's not going to happen. Well, can I get the, the Christian faith in one volume? Uh, well, you can get it in the King James Bible, but all the other subjects? No, it's going to take you years of study. 
years and years and years and years. It's going to be a lifelong time of study. Oh, that sounds difficult. Yes. Doesn't sound very convenient. No. <laughs> it's going to take you a long time. And there are some things you can even understand in your mind, but until you actually get into a conversation with somebody, until you get some battlefield time, it's really not going to make much sense. You're going to have to test and prove some parts of Scripture. And there's nothing that you can do about that. But uh, what does the Bible say about studying God's Word? Well, Proverbs chapter 2. See, I, I don't know if I want to put a lot of time into this thing. Is it really worth my time and effort? But well, we're going to see about that. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. I can tell you right now that there is no better uh, spending of your time than in the study of God's Word. And God will reveal amazing things to you and bless you for it. But uh, let's look here at Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, how do you hide God's commandments? You memorize them. You put them in your heart. You have to be able to know them. Memorize them. Verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding. The Bible says back in the book of James, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. God's not going to upbraid you, which means correct you. He's not going to come down on you. How dare you ask me for wisdom? Who do you think you are? <laughs> uh, uh God wants you to ask for wisdom. And you know it says here, If thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, you're to pray to God and say, Please, Lord, help me to understand this thing. Verse 4, if thou seekest her as silver. Now, what's the her there? Wisdom. There was a satanic cult leader down in Waco, Texas, named David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, and he taught that the her was the Holy Spirit. He was a Satanist, the guy. Now, I don't agree what they did to him. Down there, the Branch Davidians, it was very wrong. But the point is, he was teaching that, and I won't even get into all this stuff, but the six-pointed star, the upward-pointing triangle was the male, and the downward-pointing triangle was the female, and you put the two together, and you have what the Bible calls the marriage bed. Or fornication, if you're not married. And that was the holy rite, you know. That's straight out of the occult. So when you have somebody that says that the her there is the Holy Spirit, don't believe it for one second. It's talking about wisdom. But anyhow, verse 4, If thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Now, if you wanted to go on a treasure hunt, you know, does it take effort? Mm-hmm. You know, a while back I got a uh, metal detector, a couple years ago, I guess, and I went out looking for... I was, you know, had these dreams, I was going to find all these silver coins, and I went to the right places and stuff walking along, beep, oh wow, I found one, this is wonderful, and I dig, oh, it's a nail, all nuts, <laughs> you know, you go a little bit farther, beep, oh, I found a, this This has got to be a silver coin this time, you dig it up, oh, it's a bottle cap, you know, <laughs> you know what, it's, it's a lot like Christianity, a lot of times you'll be going along and you'll be searching for knowledge and stuff from the word of God, and you'll go, oh, this guy sounds like he's using the King James, Oh, yeah, sounds good. And all of a sudden, oh, no, he just said, he didn't just say what I think he said. He just said the Catholic Church is okay. Oh, you know, I got another nail. No silver this time. <laughs> you know, throw it back. Or you'll hear some guy and he's really going along good and he's, he's cutting on the Catholic Church and he says, okay, turn in your Bibles. And then he reads, you know, from the NIV or something. And you go, oh. well, what's the deal? Well, you have to search. For knowledge, you can't get it conveniently. I can tell you in this area, I don't know of one radio station that I would agree with and, and recommend 100% of the time. There are some radio stations around here. We have WDAC, and they play some good hymns, but then they play others that are not any good. And they'll play guys that are preachers that are no good. You shouldn't listen to them. 
But continuing on here, verse 6. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of, the, of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. Every good path. Verse 10, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. The best way for you to avoid getting scammed and getting deceived by false prophets is to ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding. You say, well, He'll give it to me like within the first month of being saved, right? Wrong. It takes you a long time. Like I said, it's going to take you a lifetime. I've been deceived in the last year. Even after studying intensely for you know over 10 years. There have been things I've been tricked on. You know, I, I, there are things that get by me. I mean, <laughs> don't think because you've been saved for a couple months or a year or two that, you know, I got it figured out now. Uh, not quite. You have to continually ask the Lord for wisdom and understanding. And as you get older, you know, verses 10 and 11 there, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. Discretion and understanding are something that elderly people should have. Older Christians should have discretion and understanding. It's good to talk to older people, by the way. If you see an older saint in the Lord, and they've been saved for a very, very long time, usually they have lots and lots of wisdom that you can benefit from. And a lot of young people have this, this idea that, I'll just, ah, the old people, what do they know? You know? That's the modern church mentality. The old people know a lot. You know, I remember just another quick little story here. I was at a church the one time, and this older man came up to me, and he was probably in his 80s, and and uh, we just got to talk, and he just had this real peaceful, real whiz, just wise way that he spoke, and and uh, he said something about the weather, and he said, yeah, he said this this rain all the time. He said it just puts me back to my time, you know, in the military. He said it reminds me of Normandy, he said, and I said, I said, oh, you were in World War II. He said, yeah. He said, I fought in D-Day and a couple of the other battles back then. And then the service started, and he's like, oh, I better go sit down. And I'm like, <laughs> wait, well, hold on, hold on. Can we just? You know, I was like, I wanted to talk to the guy so bad. This old, you know, hero of World War II. I mean, went through some really amazing battles, and just. You know, been saved for years and years and years. And I thought, boy, the things that you could learn from a man like that. Just amazing. And you say, well, then uh, he learned it all very quickly, right? No. A lifetime of learning. Turn over to Ecclesiastes. The next book in your Bible. Ecclesiastes 12. 12. And I'm going to show you right here, this is the reason why most people don't want to put in the time to study. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 12. And further, by these my son be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. You know one of the best ways to put your flesh down as a Christian? Spend much time in study. You know? I mean, one of the things that will make me more sleepy than anything is if I listen to, like, put Alexander Scorby in reading the King James Bible and listen to the whole book of, like, 1 Corinthians and half of 2 Corinthians. Something like that. Just, like, an hour and a half, two hours of listening to nothing but Scripture. At the end of the thing, I'm just like... Uh, and it's not because it's boring. It's just because it's a weariness to the flesh. My flesh is going, I want something I can move to, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, nope, you know, just do your work and listen to the Bible for a couple of hours. That's a weariness of the flesh. 
And when you have a subject that you're researching or studying or whatever, and you spend a couple hours on it, it wears you out. It really does. How about the next one here? Convenient peace. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, how do you have the peace of God? A lot of people say, I'm a Christian, so I have the peace of God. Ooh, just hold on a second there. There's a condition. The condition is in verse 6. Be careful for nothing. Okay? Uh, and the second part, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. Can the lost world fake having peace? Yeah, they can. But here's the reality. Um, Isaiah chapter 57, verses 20 and 21. I'll just read this real quick here. It says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Okay, one of the reasons the wicked or the uh, the lost world are oftentimes don't seem very settled is because they don't have that true peace that comes from being saved. Turn back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 165. says here, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You have to love the Word of God. And what does it mean when you love the Word of God? It means that you put it into practice. It doesn't just mean that you carry around the Bible, you know, hugging it and kissing it, you know. That's not going to do you any good. You know, you actually have to open it up and read it and love it and memorize it. Hide it in your heart, like we, like we talked about earlier. And you will have peace by understanding Scripture. We can have peace even though this country is falling apart right now because we know that the Bible prophesies these things. And it's kind of interesting too because a lot of Christians try to find peace the way, the same way that the lost world does. You know, they'll go to the same things, you know, and, and try to have convenient peace, you know, because it's easier to just sit down and pop a DVD in, you know, watch a movie and escape from reality or something. But here's how to have true peace. Turn back to Psalm 8. And I'll tell you, this is one that's, that's not convenient sometimes. But this is one that's really, really good for you to do if you're saved. Psalm 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouths or out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now look at verse three. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Now here this morning at Bible Believers Fellowship we sang How Great Thou Art. And it talks about how that when you consider the works of the Lord's hands and you see the woods and you see you hear the rolling thunder and you see the rivers and things like that. Well, what are you doing? When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers. When you consider what God has created out there in nature, you start to kind of, your fear of man starts to kind of fade. And you say the God that created all this out here, all the beauty of, of nature He's my Father. He can protect me. Verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth 
through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Did you know we're supposed to have dominion over nature? He's saying, oh, we're supposed to chain it off and say no people allowed. Nature preserve. You know, no human activity. That's not of the Lord. We're not supposed to do that. So, turn next to Luke chapter 12. There's an old saying, old saying, excuse me, old saying that says that you need to stop and smell the roses occasionally. That means don't get so busy with your life that you don't consider what God has made. Sometimes you need to go out in nature and just enjoy it and see taking the beauty of what God's created. Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Okay, and this is instruction in righteousness here. Okay, he's talking mainly about millennial kingdom things here where he's going to provide for his people. But instruction in righteousness is still there. Uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 24. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls. And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which thing or that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Now look at verse twenty seven. Consider the lilies how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Now verses 24 and verse 27 both start out with the same word. What's the word? It's consider. Now how can you consider something by just thinking it in your mind? You can't. Consider the ravens. Go out and look at the birds sometime. Watch watch the birds. Watch how they fly. It's always fascinating to me see, to see how birds will fly through the woods. And I think, could I do that? No. <laughs> I'd be the bird. If I was a bird, I'd be the one that whacks into the window. You know? <laughs> You're there in the, in the house sometime and you'll hear a whoomp. And you see a bird laying out there kind of kicking on the grass like, oh man. That'd be me. You know, I'd be probably a very clumsy bird. It's amazing how a bird flies. It's amazing how God's created them. And how about the lilies? When's the last time that you actually stopped and really, really studied a flower? Get down and look at the thing and look at look at the intricacies of the thing. And then say, is there any piece of cloth that I know of out there that is as bright as that, that is as finely made as that, as delicate? No. It's amazing. And... What is a flower? Especially a wildflower. Go out into a field someplace and look at some of the wildflowers that grow. And they, they get bailed up with the straw and the hay a lot of times. And, you know, sometimes they're cast into the oven, as it says here. They're burned. Okay, I know a practice in some countries I've been to is, you know, instead of mowing the grass, they'll just burn it. You know? Uh, and, of course, they do that sometimes here, and then it gets away from you. You have big forest fires, but that's another story. But the whole point is, peace comes from doing things the Lord's way. Don't think that you're going to have peace by going to the world and by worldly entertainment. You say, well, it's a lot more convenient to sit down in my living room and, and you know, a nice air-conditioned comfort and watch a video. Now, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that you can never do that. All I'm saying is, don't think that you're going to have peace if you're on the Internet 10, 12 hours a day. It's not going to happen. Once in a while, you have to get up and consider what God has made. It's very important. And you say, well, it's not convenient. So, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get sweaty and it takes time to drive to the park or to drive out to the woods or something. Yep. But you see, danger of convenience. It's a lot more convenient to watch TV or whatever for your entertainment. But it's not as good for you. Okay, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. 
I'm going to read down through a couple verses here, and we're going to see the thing of how man changes and perverts the things that God has created out there in nature. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. How does God show himself to the lost world? Verse 20. For the invisible things of him, you can't see God, it says here, but the, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. When I consider thy heavens, when I consider the work of thy hands, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. If you are an evolutionist, you have no excuse. You can't look at nature and really study it, look at a flower, look at the way the bird flies, and say, that happened by random chance. You can't do that. Verse 21, Because that when they knew God, when they realized, hey, there is a creator, in other words, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And then it goes on down through there talking about sodomy in the next verse. Okay? Why has America fallen? Why has God given up on this nation? Because of evolution. They do not glorify God anymore for the things that God has created. That's a big problem. All right, one more place to turn to. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. And again, we've, we've covered a lot of these verses, I realize, but it's good to just to keep going over them. Uh, it's easy to forget things. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. You know, when things are falling apart in the world, the best thing to do is just go out and consider what God has made. Fix yourself some kind of good food that takes a little bit of time, you know, don't expect to eat junk food and be on the internet and it's a lot more convenient. Yeah. Just go grab a candy bar and a soda or something like that and go and watch more videos on YouTube or something. You know? And I've been guilty of that. I've done, you know, done things like that and I don't feel better after I'm done. Sometimes you have to take a little bit of time to go out and smell the roses. As I said, to go out and consider what God has made. Get away from the electronic world and go out there eat some good food go out you know this time of the year we have berries and things they're good for you and it's something that God has made verse 9 those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you you know the story I read this morning and you know, you don't have to be real bright to see that things are getting pretty bad right now in our world. It's just amazing. I mean, you know, a friend of mine and I, we used to talk about how, you know, I wonder what's going to happen this week. Now it's like, I wonder what's going to happen today in our world. You know, just yesterday, we had a huge power outage and like the whole state of West Virginia was out of electricity. Almost the whole state. It's things are getting very, very chaotic. I mean, the, this thunderstorm we had the other night, it was lightning just almost nonstop for quite some time, middle middle of the night. And a lot of people got hit. A lot of people lost electricity. 
I mean, people got hit as in their homes and things, you know, their area got hit. Things are getting more and more chaotic, and the best thing that you can do when things are like that is just unplug from it a little bit. And just be like, hmm, yeah, okay, well, I'm going to go outside and just look at what God's made. Go out and consider the ravens. Consider the lilies. Consider the works of God's hands. And then say, how great thou art. You know, one of the neatest things that I've experienced in my life is when I make something as a wood turner, a, a bowl or something like that, and it's sitting there, and somebody comes in and just looks at it, and they're like, that is really beautiful. And they come and they say, Brian, that's, that's just amazing. I've never seen a piece as, as nice as that. And that's just me. I mean, it's just kind of a carnal thing there. But what about the Lord? When the Lord makes things out in nature, when He gives you food, when He gives you health, He wants to hear about it. You're to pray and thank Him. Okay? Verse 6 up there that we read earlier. Be careful for nothing. Don't be full of care. Be careful for nothing. God's got things in control. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You want to know how to have peace Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9 tell you how to do it. And it might not be convenient, but you're going to have to do some things that are not convenient if you want to keep your sanity in the years ahead until the Lord takes us out of here. Okay, so watch out for things that the world calls convenient. Because most of the times, the convenience things of the world are quicker, but a lot more dangerous. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.